Hi, I'm Poonam Schallenberger. Welcome to this episode of The Square. I'm here with Chloe Hosted, design researcher in our education studio. Welcome, Chloe. Thank you for having me. Chloe, I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, mental health is kind of an overdue topic, but one mm -hmm. that we're starting to explore a lot more when it comes to schools and classrooms and how they yes. impact children and teachers. Um, we've started to see it a lot more when it comes to thinking about anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that conversation evolve over the past couple of years? Yes, and I would say over the past couple of years, just with everything that the whole education community has faced um, with the pandemic, with you know social issues that have arised over the last couple of years as well, um, there's a much greater focus when we're talking with our education clients and communities about really trying to address mental health in a meaningful way to provide restorative, restorative environments um, and to meaningfully support you know both teachers and students, but also the whole school community because schools are really at the heart of communities, so they do so much to support everyone, not just from an education perspective, um, but from a variety of different perspectives as well. Um, so it's really become a huge topic. Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about the purpose of schools, yes. obviously we want our kids to be able to go there, learn what they're supposed to learn. But if we're not addressing their mental health or maybe even their mm -hmm. emotional and social behavioral well-being, it's hard to think about how they're going to be able to show up as the best version of themselves. Yes. And I think for parents, um, when we were able to see our children learning from home or trying to learn from home, we were starting to understand just how much their mental health affects or impacts their ability to learn the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, if you think about the amount of time that kids are spending in school and just how much change developmentally occurs throughout their education journey, and it just really captures how holistic that learning and growing process is um, that schools have to meaningfully support. I and mean, it's not just, as you mentioned, the academic development. Um, it's that social and emotional awareness, you know, emotion regulation, learning how to interact meaningfully with peers and with older mentors, um, you know, also just, you know, helping kids to discover their identity, who they are, what they're interested in, what they want to bring to the world. Um, so it's really just forming little humans, you know, from the very beginning of their developmental journey all the way up through higher education, the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so comprehensive, which is really interesting and complex. Yeah. So schools really have to shoulder a lot, right? Mm -hmm. We're resp they're responsible for delivering the curriculum, but then also addressing mental health issues like anxiety or depression, and then helping students navigate their social development. Um, but it's so much more than whether or not you have a formal diagnosis. There's so many factors that might affect your well-being mm -hmm. when you move through school. I mean, I think about things like socioeconomic differences, language differences, mm -hmm. someone's home situation may or may not be the safest. How, how have we expanded our notion of when you're designing a space and you're thinking about the mental or the full, let's just call it the total well-being of a child. How have we expanded our notion to be more than these like formal diagnoses? Absolutely. Um, beyond a formal diagnosis, um, there's sources of stress that may be kind of individual to the person that they may be experiencing, uh, whether that's kind of an acute situation, whether it's academic stress, something that's going on at home. Um, global events has become a huge factor, I think, um, especially with, you know, COVID, you know, school safety issues. Um, there's just kind of, we have to recognize that there's, everybody's going to be coming into education spaces with their own subjective experience of what that space is doing for them, whether it's supporting them, whether it's adding more stress. Um, so I think from the design sort of perspective, we consider um, a variety of things ranging from um, addressing stress, um, and that can be achieved by um, connecting to nature and providing some restorative elements to help people emotionally regulate when they need to. Um, we think about developmental alignment, uh, making sure that our spaces are well aligned with individual needs um, as students move through their developmental journey, um, thinking about like physical comfort, um, the quality of the physical environment, um, even just the ability to adapt and change the environment as needed to align with individual needs. Um, you know, there's differences in learning styles. There's differences in personality. Um, people are kind of impacted by the sensory environment in different ways. So you just think about all of these different individuals trying to occupy this one space in an education sort of facility, and there's just so many different interrelated factors. To yeah, consider. it's not like you can check all of those parts of you at no. the door, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for children. I think, you know, when we think about adults and when we go into a workplace, 
certainly even workplaces have had that sort of expectation that they start to think about our total well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, but as adults, we're maybe a little bit more able to kind of understand the, the primary function of places, right? Yes. And to say, okay, I'm coming to work and it's supposed to help my productivity or my ability to collaborate with my peers. Mm-hmm. But for students, it's probably a lot harder to do. And, and like you said, it's kind of like the purpose of school is to do more than to just deliver a curriculum. And uh, But I would imagine that those sort of challenges for students evolve as they grow, right? What yeah. The sort of challenges for a three-year-old or a elementary school child is probably vastly different than the sort of social, mental, emotional, and behavioral, behavioral challenges for, mm-hmm. for a higher ed student, maybe. Yeah. How do you see those changes evolving? I mean, like if we're looking at an elementary school student, can you walk me through some of the, like if we were to put ourselves in the shoes of an elementary school student, mm-hmm. how do we get beyond the typical conversation of mental health and think about what maybe they're navigating as they're moving through kindergarten and their first few grades of school. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, layers. Um, There's kind of a cognitive sort of layer with that. I mean, as kids are developing over time from, you know, preschool all the way up, if we're focusing on elementary to fifth or sixth grade, um, then there's just going to be a lot of change that's happening in their brains as that's developing. So that changes how they're able to kind of uh, filter out distractions in the learning environment, uh, how they're engaging with the world, even how they relate to place. Um, So it's just Um, For elementary students, I think we really focus on trying to help make that transition from home life to being in school um, and really trying to take advantage of their natural desire to explore, to play, to grow, and to connect. Uh, Focus on designing spaces that are driven more by curiosity, that have a sense of warmth and welcomingness, um, to just make kids feel at home, that they feel comfortable. Um, Because when students feel comfortable, they feel safe, they feel secure, then they're able to really activate their learning. Um, If kids are walking into the learning environment and they're feeling stressed, they're not feeling supported, their basic needs aren't being met, um, then they really can't learn. Um, So I think we just really try to make sure that the space is well aligned with um, their needs. So it seems like that sort of goal of creating spaces that inspire, that encourage curiosity, that help students feel safe is a really enduring expectation of, of space. It's one that I think that in your early years is especially important for students, uh, regardless of generation. But I think that this new sort of trend of of kids growing up stir, how does that kind of change the way that we experience schools and experience spaces as a young person? Absolutely. And I think these developmental considerations can provide a really good framework for starting to understand where are um, in the spaces that we're designing for them. Um, so there's actually a trend called up aging, um, which is exactly what you're speaking to with kids kind of reaching that social maturity faster. Um, and there's a few different reasons. Um, so actually, biologically, there's been kind of a study over the last century looking at when the onset of physical maturity or puberty is occurring. Um, and over time, that's actually beca- been happening earlier. Um, so kids are reaching that physical maturity at an earlier age. Um, from a social perspective, um, with all of the exposure that kids these days have to external influences through the internet, through social media. Um, all of those experiences kind of accelerate that social maturity process. They're trying to you know, behave like teenagers. They're trying to kind of um, embody a, a later state of developmental being. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I feel like I'm going to sound so cliche <laughs> when I say this, but it's like, oh my gosh, social media, right? Yeah, like yeah. how it impacts students. I mean, we can't we can't ignore that. And yeah. I know when I'm on Instagram or, or Facebook or really any social media platform, it feels like, or even on television, it feels like children just look older. And I know I sound so, so, so cliche <laughs> when I say that. Um, but from the clothes or the makeup trends or even the material goods that they mm-hmm. own and how they present themselves. Yes. So it's not just a thing. This No, this is... no, this has been observed. Um, there are social demographers in Australia who kind of uh, were looking at this more closely, especially with um, even kids' consumer behavior. They're much more sophisticated consumers of you know, information, of media, of uh, products and services 
really just kind of like accelerating that process of being these very aware, um, very socially mature, um, in some ways, uh, people. Um, so there's that sort of consideration, um, but then also from an education sort of lens as well, um, kids are engaging with formal education at an earlier age. Um, so between the biological, these socialists and engaging with education sooner, um, really that's kind of shifting onset of adolescence earlier um, than it has been in the past. So when we're talking about mental health, or mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this is a bigger topic than mental health. It, when we think about this sort of conversation, it's about mental health, health, behavioral health, kind of our total wellness, if you will. Mm -hmm. How does this idea of up-aging impact the, a kid walks into a school? Yeah, um, and I think one thing I'd like to highlight is just like with adolescents, I think we all understand you know, that period of development it brings a lot of really great experiences and opportunities. You're kind of engaging with the world in a new way, discovering who you are, but it also brings a lot of challenges. And that is a period of development where a lot of mental and emotional health issues can kind of come to the forefront and they can really start to impact students um, and their overall well-being, you know, how they see themselves. Um, you can see a rise in, you know, suicidal ideation, mental and emotional health issues. Mm -hmm. um, so those things are you know, very important to be aware of. Um, so just from the reading that I've done, I just, I feel like that period of development really deserves some special focused attention. Um, so if we think about that period of adolescence extending longer, starting earlier, um, then really trying to be mindful of um, putting students in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school, um, just really trying to um, provide them the support that they need to grow in a healthy way um, and to have the support that they need um, from an emotional standpoint is super important. I, I find this idea of up aging mm -hmm. especially interesting. So yeah. it's, you know, you take a second grader or third grader, not only are there influences, their media influences, and their social influences, academic and, and biological changes encouraging them to grow up faster. They're, they're sort of competing with their own sort of development as well. So how do you balance a child being a child while also wanting to grow up so much faster than maybe previous generations did? Yeah, and I think balance is a key word when we talk about education and um, with development. All um, so I think you know, just like helping kids to slow down and to be playful, to be creative, you know, explore and to be kids um, is so important. Um, so I think you know, when we're designing spaces, we want to make sure that the space you know inspires that kind of thinking because um, that more playful approach is really where learning comes from, and that's going to be a much more a much stronger foundation for how students approach education moving forward if they're engaging with it in a playful, intuitive, you know, creative sort of a way. Um, so we don't want that to go away with like, you know, this push towards growing up faster, um, but then also wanting to support, you know, that growing desire for independence, that desire to self-advocate, to form um, really um, lasting relationships, to, you know, interact with peers. Um, all of those things can be very positive. Um, or just awareness in general of what's going on in the world, that can be very positive too, channeled in a, in a good way. Um, so yeah, the balance I think is so important. How do you design independence for like a five-year-old? <laughs> well, like preserving yeah. their safety and mm -hmm. you know supervision and all those things that we need to do. Right, and I think that's where mental alignment comes in. Um, and it, for a five, that's you know a little bit different. I think with the up aging trend, we're talking a little bit in elementary school, you know, fourth or fifth grade. Um, but you know, just overall for a phase of development, um, you know, building in an appropriate level of independence, you know, creating opportunities for students to guide their own learning experiences with um, flexible furniture or just um, spaces that have strong, you know, monitoring from teachers and staff can still see what kids are doing, but that allow them to kind of go off on their own and engage in a way that, you know, feels intuitive to them. Um, so we see a lot more of these integrated collaboration spaces um, where students have the ability to go out um, and work together to solve problems, to work on projects, um, having those integrated within the classroom environment or within classroom pods um, just creates like a little safe space for them to grow that capacity to be independent. Um, and then as students start to get older, just, you know, loosening the rope a little bit and giving them opportunities 
to, you know, be more independent, to, um, you know, have a little bit more time, um, which of course you also have to balance with middle school and high school. You want to loosen the rope too much. Um, so just making sure that there's that balance between economy and independence and monitoring and safety. So balance. You know, I also find that um, in addition to balance, the sorts of spaces we offer mm -hmm. students, even at a young age, is especially important, probably has changed too from when I was in school. Um, because today, interesting, I came across a kid the other day, um, maybe like nine or 10 years old, mm -hmm. and he had like a beverage with him and he was getting ready to like sell this beverage. And I was like, oh, is this like money for baseball? Like, what is this for? Mm -hmm. He was like, no, just like, I bought these beverages and now I'm selling them. At some of it's a very entrepreneurial sort of yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that that spirit or that sort of thinking is not exclusive to him and that probably a lot of kids are doing things besides just playing on the playground and so probably also designing spaces for them even outside of the classroom that during their downtime before school after school in between classes or recess mm -hmm. they what kind of spaces do they need access to now yeah, so I think the term speaking to is very true. Um, it's kind of a characteristic discussed about Generation Alpha, which is the emerging generation. Um, they're born 2010 to 2025. Um, so the oldest kids are in middle school right now, and the youngest have yet to be born. Um, so, you know, they're still figuring out exactly what this generation is. We're, you know, observing, of course, as things are happening in real time. Um, but one thing that's been known with alphas is that they do have this very strong drive for entrepreneurship, for, you know, sharing what they know, the things that they create um, through social media um, in their communities. Um, and they're also, because of their awareness of what's going on in the world, um, there's, you know, this desire for activism and being, you know, making positive change in the world. Um, so that tendency that you know desire to create and to share um, to innovate and to you know be entrepreneurial in their approach um, is something that education really should capitalize on and nurture um, so I think the spaces that we're seeing um, that are focused on supporting that drive um, and you see these kind of career focused environments or stem labs um, just like any type of hands-on learning environment you see that being integrated at younger and younger age levels. Um, you know, there's even elementary STEM schools um, or these you know, magnet programs where you know, that innovative lens is being applied at an earlier age to help kids develop those core competencies that they need to be innovators and entrepreneurs and creatives. Um, so that's definitely happening younger and younger. Yeah. And I, and I know probably at first glance, it probably <laughs> seems like this is disconnected from the mental, social well-being conversation. But I think that it really speaks to a empowering a child to be able to explore that sense of self, that mm -hmm. sense of identity and what they want to do, which probably becomes more and more important when you enter your middle school years, right? Yes. So how, how does, what's that transition look like for a kid moving from elementary school to to middle school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and mean, I think as you mentioned, um, this process of discovering identity, I mean, that's really core, I think, to what the middle school experience is about. Um, this is really where kids are starting to understand themselves in a different way into the re relation to the world around them, to their peers, kind of a greater social awareness on that front. Um, so that can be really challenging, um, but providing students with constructive opportunities to explore their interests, to connect with people who may have similar interests or perspective on the world, to kind of find their people, to find their tribe, um, to find something that they're really passionate about and that they could really focus their energy on um, and grow into something that could be you know, a way that they can impact the world in a positive way. Um, it's really about that process of building a strong sense of identity um, and then working towards self-actualization. Yeah, I know. So again, super cliche, <laughs> social media. Um, but I know social media gets a lot of flack mm -hmm. for consumerism and, you know, f fueling the sort of comparison and yeah, body image. Exactly. Yeah. All of that stuff. But I I've noticed that children today are also posting, and I don't even know if children's like, whatever. <laughs> um, it, you know, students are are posting not just about the, tr like the, let me say that again. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> So I know social media gets a lot of flack for kind of promoting consumerism, you know, fueling body image issues, comparison, all, all of the stuff that we, the sort of ills that we associate with, mm -hmm. with social media. But I've also seen a lot of young people post about global issues, about, mm -hmm. you know, um, activism for certain causes. And so you bring up a really interesting point about 
how do you create spaces that allow students who are who are becoming more and more of a young adult at this stage to be able to test those interests, to be able to explore them and to be able to give them a platform where they're able to vocalize that and and kind of build community around it? Absolutely. And I think the idea of empowerment is a really great way to look at, you know, supporting students as they move into this phase. Um, and really all that is all about providing opportunities that are constructive. Um, so I think, you know, we try to make sure that there's those visible opportunities um, to see those resources, but then also creating spaces where constructive interaction um, between peers and mentors can occur. Um, so, you know, there's a great focus on these collaborative environments, you know, where students can come together um, in a social sort of setting or to work, you know, hands on on a project, say that they're really interested in addressing some sort of global challenge or a local community challenge, um, creating a space where students can come together and bring brainstorm and develop a product and build a prototype um, and then actually start an entrepreneurial endeavor. That's something that I feel like we're seeing a lot more now um, and a, a strong sense of community connection and engagement. Um, you know, just like really connecting the school environment with the local community and building that bridge yeah. um, and helping kids see how their learning experiences, their talents and their skills and what they can offer can really have a meaningful impact. It used to be that like student unions were mm -hmm. pretty exclusively at, on college campuses, yeah. right? And now you're probably seeing them in, in middle school even um, or some version of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you put you, – you talked about putting learning on display. How, how do you do that? How do you – how do you expose a child? Because it's it's such a thing that, like, as an adult, we're like, oh, I never knew this career existed, right? Mm -hmm. Or someone told me I was good at this, but I never really knew what to do with it. How do you put learning on display and encourage a child to continue to explore? I think we focus on integrating some of these career technology environments a lot more um, at earlier phases of development, as we discussed. Um, so just, you know, creating environments where they can see, you know, anything ranging from STEM fields to medical to the arts to construction and engineering, um, all of these different programs kind of happening together in one space. And students can walk down the hallway and see what their peers are doing in one class and maybe connect it to something that they're learning um, in their program and just finding those interdisciplinary connections. Um, just because so many of the challenges that we face in the world and really the workforce shifting towards being a more inter interdisciplinary, interconnected um, sort of place, I think that really encourages students to you know, explore opportunities to try to make connections. Um, and I think, too, in those environments where there's a lot of really active, engaged learning going on, uh, where students can see the learning process unfold, um, can be really exciting um, and provide that level of engagement and interest. Um, and then just, you know, if students create um, different artifacts through their learning experience, you know, making that visible in the rest of the school environment, putting things on display mm -hmm. um, can be really valuable to provide that sense of pride. Yeah, I think that idea of sense of self and sense of pride mm -hmm. is so important. Um, for So my social media guilty pleasure is YouTube. <laughs> okay. And um, I see, like, so you know how it, like, serves you the sort of content that they think you'll like? And they're so spot on. And yeah. and you're just, like, you fall down this rabbit hole. But um, I've, I've noticed a trend of something called, like, core. Like, there's, like, cottage core. Mm -hmm. Or it's, like, mm -hmm. it tries to kind of capture this idea of of here's this nice, neat package of what this kind of person is supposed to be like, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it's what they eat in a day. It's what their morning routine looks like. It's how they dress. And so it's like this neatly packaged personality or identity almost. Mm -hmm. And and I think about that when I – and this idea of a self-identity kind of competing with each other. How do you consider that when you are designing a space – for a middle schooler or even a high schooler as they're competing with, this is this neatly packaged personality. And then also I feel like I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Yeah, um, and I think it's so important for us as just like as a society to acknowledge that that neatly packaged person, it doesn't exist, that's a fallacy. Um, so I just, you know, hope that we can eliminate that over time. But um, in the school context, um, I think that's maybe where, you know, again, building on the learning on display sort of idea, just seeing the learning process to having things not be just like, here's a neat, finished, beautiful thing, but like actually embracing the process of learning, which can be messy, um, you know, just creating 
spaces where it's okay to explore and to you know be working on growing skills and and competencies as opposed to just like everything has to be perfect and finished. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those kind of messy hands-on project work spaces that are meant to get a little crazy, maybe letting students take control of an environment and you know have fun, um, putting fun back in learning. I feel like can help to eliminate some of that artificially imposed, just like this is what something needs to look like, just having it be more organic. Right, and I would imagine that mm -hmm. maybe even positioning different mm -hmm. disciplines strategically in proximity to each other, where yeah. like maybe the theater kid's able to see a robotics mm -hmm. thing and a robotics kid's able to explore drama, so that it, it kind of encourages a interdisciplinary and sort of approach too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Or just creating opportunities for meaningful interact inter um, intersections and connections. Um, I tend to like to think about outdoor spaces, courtyards, outdoor learning environments as these really great opportunities for the interconnection of very, you know, different areas of the school to come together, for different communities to come together and have it be this space where everything is happening at once. Um, so I think both, you know, from the exterior side of things, thinking about these outdoor spaces, you know, because nature, natural environments are imperfect. They're, you know, organic and um, natural in nature, obviously. Um, but then carrying that same idea into the interior space as well, creating spaces where things start to intersect and they come together and, you know, creating nodes um, where you have an intersection of people and ideas, I think can be really powerful um, to help students, you know, see what else is going on in the school, to learn from others, um, and just to recognize that learning is a process of growth. I mean, it's, you can't walk into an opportunity and be great at it right away to see the learning process unfold, I think can be really powerful. Yeah, that fluidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then as you move into your high school years here, how, how does that kind of change the way you experience spaces then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think with high school, I mean, that you know, if students are becoming much more aware maybe of what their interest is beyond, you know, formal K-12 education. Um, they're starting to look ahead to what they might want to do um, in their career, in the workforce. Um, if they want to go to college, you know, working towards that goal. If they want to enroll in the military or enlist in the military, you know, any of those post-graduation opportunities, um, really starting to have that reality settle in that there is this transition from high school into the next phase of life where the student is much more in charge of what their destiny looks like, which is exciting and scary. At oh the my same gosh, time. so scary. Like yeah. when you say like reality setting mm -hmm. in, yeah. that's that's like struck me. It's like the first time in your maybe educational journey yeah. that you're being scored and weighed. You have SAT mm -hmm. tests and, you know, yeah. GPAs being considered and resumes about your extracurricular involvements mm -hmm. in ways that maybe in elementary school and middle school you weren't it, it's got to kind of make you look at yourself a little differently. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's very much like a mirror. I mean, I think we all remember that experience of having to sit down and write out your college essays or write up a resume, and you have to quantify your life experience so far, and you're only in high school. Yeah. So it's just, especially with how much pressure there is and just like this culture of excellence, you know, it's just, it puts so much weight on every aspect of who you are as a person. Um, and I feel like that can create a lot of stress and anxiety about, you know, what's coming next um, when you become much more responsible for your own fate moving forward. Uh, so that's weighty. Yeah. I, so I would imagine that those outdoor spaces mm -hmm. become really helpful. Yeah. How else do you maybe help navigate stress and anxiety for high schoolers? Yes, um, absolutely. My favorite is, of course, connections to nature. There's so much robust research that just, you know, underscores the value of connecting to natural environments, you know, seeing dense vegetation, um, having access to the outdoors and fresh air. It really can support, you know, physical health and well-being as well as, you know, mental and emotional health. Um, there's been documented evidence of time spent in natural environments reducing physiological stress, um, as well as just um, restoring limited cognitive functions like attention. Um, so those environments can be really impactful for providing that reprieve that students really need, um, whether that's cognitively or emotionally. Um, so whether that's, you know, taking students outside physically or just bringing the outdoors in uh, with connections and views to the outdoors, bringing in natural elements and materials, even natural patterns. I could nerd out about statistical fractals, but I'll rein it in. Um, so like that's, there's a lot of really great research um, related to that. So I think um, connecting to nature is a really great opportunity. Um, but then I think also providing spaces where students 
students can, you know, self-regulate emotionally. Um, and I know in the school environment, I mean, many students, the only space that they have that they can really be alone and just like take a beat if they need it is in the bathroom. And like, mm -hmm. that's probably something that needs to change given this increasing focus on wellness and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, over the last few generations uh, with millennials, Gen Z, and now Alpha, there's this growing expectation that all aspects of life will support you know, an individual's opportunity to thrive um, and not just, you know, to exist, but to, to thrive and reach our full potential. Um, so I think as students become increasingly aware of their own well-being and their own wellness, they have more language to kind of speak about it and ask, you know, for the things that they need. Um, I think that changes how they look at the physical environment. I know when we've done visioning sessions with high school students for our projects, they're very aware of like the physical environment, the aesthetics, how it makes them feel. Um, they're very sophisticated. How so? so what, what, what have you heard? Yeah, so they talk a lot about natural light and natural materials. Um, I've had two separate student groups advocate for their fellow students to have prayer rooms or meditation rooms on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so kids are becoming much more aware of their own needs, the needs of others, and they're being much more of a self-advocate trying to express those needs. Um, so I think that just shows that their level of awareness, you know, is really, it's there. Um, so we need to be providing high quality environments that align with those expectations and those needs. It sounds like we're facing a continued sort of expectation mm -hmm. that the environment consider how we feel when we when we walk into space, whether it's at work or if you're a student, um, maybe you're, you're not even a high school student who, who has a sort of sensitivity to that, but we're, we as as parents and teachers and educators are starting to understand more and more the impact of these spaces. Mm -hmm. What are you most looking forward to as you kind of marry design and research and its power to be able to impact how we feel? Yeah, and I really love connecting design and you know research, especially in the lens of education environments, and it's so rich with all of these different considerations and incredibly complex. So I think, you know, to me, what's most exciting is some momentum with incre um, integrating areas of research like, you know, mental and emotional health, the behavioral and brain sciences, understanding the power of nature, um, just all of these different areas of research really coming together with the goal of really supporting the development of, you know, healthy people who are going to be, you know, leading the world uh, when they leave of education. Um, so I think that's the most, you know, powerful and exciting thing. And just seeing, you know, how students are really um, becoming much more, you know, capable of expressing those needs and making sure that their needs are being met. Um, so I'm just excited to see how all of that will unfold as we move forward. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Chloe. It was a pleasure chatting mm -hmm. with you. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Square. We'll see you next time.